What's up, everybody, and welcome back to the show. Uh, today, we're basically just recapping the fights from over the weekend, some other shit that went down, some things that are making headlines in the news, all that good stuff, right? But I wanted to first talk about um, the, I mean, fucking weird kind of Bellator card that went down, right? Uh, I don't know if you guys saw, but the fight between Jeremy Kennedy and Aaron Pico, Pico dislocated his shoulder at the end of the first round, and his corner man is like, yanking on his fucking arm trying to snap it back into place it's fucking crazy to watch the guy's super aggressive but he wasn't able to continue Jeremy Kennedy picks up the TKO win over Pico who is 10 and 4 now in his young career you know I mean like he's still a pretty young guy and um you know speaking of Bo Nickel you want to talk about highly touted prospects Aaron Pico is one of them um also the fight between AJ McKee and Spike Carlisle was fucking crazy like Really nuts, especially the first round. And you get to see, like, Spike Carlisle, he always starts like this, but he's a very fast, like, starter. And when he gets you into, like, certain positions, he's a really good scrambler, right? Like, he finds his ways to these fucking, like, advantageous positions out of spots that you think he's going to kind of be stuck in or struggle with, and he finds a way out and ends up on top and, you know, was able to give McKee some trouble early, but over the course of the fight, McKee just able to start dominating, maintaining that top position, taking the back of Spike Carlisle, all that good shit, right? And the next fight, uh, Patricio Ferreri retained his uh, featherweight title against Adam Borix, right? And a lot of people thought that AJ McKee and Patricio would rematch. That's obviously happening at some point down the line. And I think Bellator's kind of doing the right thing by letting these guys sort of like extend the win streak, extend the legacy, build AJ McKee up a little bit more. I think they want AJ McKee to be the champion. I mean, you got to think Patricio is 34 and five now, right? 34 wins, five losses. He has a lot of tread on the tires. So, uh, or a lot of miles on the tires, rather. You know what I mean? That tread's wearing off, rather. Like, no, he still looks great, right? But I think that, like, Bellator wants AJ McKee to be the champion in the face of Bellator. So I think when that rubber match happens, I think they want AJ McKee to win it, if I'm being honest with you. So they're holding off until they feel like he's prepared to go in and get a win over Patricio or whoever the featherweight, you know. Say so if he happens to get upset by somebody else, I think they just let McKee walk into that spotlight and take it back. But that's my personal take. Like, Bellator's got to do what they got to do, and McKee is your star, right? So, my personal opinion. Um, yeah, let's talk about this fight night card, though. Um, I thought it was an interesting card all around, you know, and what was weird, man, is like... Dana White said that, like, oh, it's total bullshit that Mark Zuckerberg rented out the entire da-da-da-da-da. And then you see it's just Mike Zuckerberg, Mark Zuckerberg, his wife, and, like, what, some friends and staff there at Facebook and shit like that. So something was going on there, right? And the controversy, and this is the one that I like to believe and at least buy into, right? Not that I do believe it, but, like, if I wanted one of them to be true, this would be it. And I think I need to give it a reason or, like, a justification because otherwise it's just weird to me that he's there doing that. Like, the fact that we're letting billionaires just rent out an event and go watch it, right, that's normally on display to the public and gets aired in everybody's houses, like, that seems, that's just weird to me. I don't know why it just doesn't sit right. So I like to believe that there's some sort of ulterior motive to this, right? And what I like to think is that this tweet that I saw, I can't remember who said it, I wish I could, like, give them credit, but I like to believe that what they're doing is trying to figure out how to, like, simulate what it would be like to be there witnessing the fights in person. And I think that when you listen to Mark Zuckerberg talk about these glasses and all this AI stuff and the metaverse and all this, right? It would make sense that he would wanna start bringing sports to you in that way, right? Like through these glasses or something so that you can put them on and sit there and watch a UFC fight and feel what it would be like to be cage side. Is that true? Fuck, I don't know. I hope so. I hope that's the reason that he would be there. It would kind of add up, right? It would make sense that this is like a very intimate sport. The UFC would be looking for a reason to do business with somebody like Facebook, right? Or Meta. There's no reason not to. They're already like, and Dana White is a businessman at the end of the day. So if he thinks it's going to be good for business, why would they not do something like this? So you have to wonder if those kind of talks are coming down the line and if this is going to be a real possibility in five or 10 years. Right? Like, if you can just sit in your living room and put on glasses and feel like you're cage sad watching a fight, are you ever going to put on the ESPN app? I mean, fuck. Who knows what direction this goes? But, like, the fact that Zuckerberg is so interested in the UFC, 
I think is actually going to be a good thing in the future. And if he gets involved with his money and stuff, we could be looking at the UFC living on the bleeding edge of some of this technological stuff and some of these new viewing experiences for people like us who don't get to go to all these fucking events and sit cage sad, right? And who kind of want that experience. I got to be honest with you. I would 100% do it. If you told, why not? I'm already watching it on a fucking screen. Why not put glasses on and feel like I'm there, right? And granted, there is sometimes like something about just kicking back and watching fights on TV. Like I do enjoy that aspect of it. And I actually think that a lot of the times like those cam reviews that you get from multiple different perspectives and stuff like that are awesome. But man, if you could, and you got to wonder what the cost of it's going to be. It'll probably be some subscription and like da, 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 right? Who knows? But man, Makes you wonder why he's so interested in everything right above the surface level. Oh, I like MMA and I'm here to witness an event. You'd like to think that there's something deeper going on. And if not, it's kind of weird that he just rented the fucking event out. <laughs> that's my opinion. Um, but anyway, he's there, right? And that's kind of like a big talk of one of the things going on. Mackenzie Dern said she heard that he rented it out during the press conference. Dana White says it's BS. But then Mark Zuckerberg's there. And if he didn't rent it, I don't know. Maybe it was just a favor. Who the fuck knows? But anyway... We'll see. We'll see what we'll see what becomes of that. Um, let's move on to the prelims real quick. We'll run through these. Guido Canetti pulled off a big upset over Randy Costa. I've, I had Costa in this fight, but man, Guido Canetti, maybe the elderly fighter, but he looked great. He went out and got a fast rear naked choke finish. Chelsea Chandler looked really good over Julia Stoliarenko. Brendan Allen, man, is somebody who always impresses me when he fights. I'm a big fan of his grappling. I'm a big fan of the way he mixes in ground and pound. Works well off his back. Hit a nice sweep to come up on top position on top of Jocko. Worked out of a bad spot. And then when he starts getting to your back, he always hunts for the choke and stuff. And he's always hunting for submissions. I'm a big Brendan Allen fan. I like watching him fight. And he picked up an impressive win over Jocko. Uh, Joaquin Silva beat Jesse Ronson with that big knee in round two. Alir Latifi and Alexi Olenek had a pretty boring fight, but I got to be honest, man. Like, you kind of expect that. These guys are getting older, two heavyweights who have been fighting a long time. What can you do? And then this was the fight that I actually, I'm going to, like, I actually felt like Daniel Santos had a really good chance to upset John Castaneda in this just because he was so aggressive. But, man, in order to do so, Santos had to eat some punishment. He got rocked a few times, and he came back and just, like, I don't, really, I don't know what kept him standing, man. Just kept coming and putting the pressure on Castaneda and was able to eventually pick up the finish and you could kind of feel the tide start to turn. But Castaneda caught him with some clean shots early on in the first round and I was like, fuck, I kind of thought Castaneda might have some trouble getting there and he did not, right? Daniel Santos, maybe not the most defensively responsible guy in the world, but man, tough as hell and he can fucking like put it on you his pressure just eventually broke castanet over the round when his cardio started to fade and a big win for santos to pick up the second round knockout um that was a fun fight uh let's see probably i thought in my opinion i don't know if it ended up winning it but i don't even know if they gave out uh like bonuses or anything but i thought that was one of the fights of the night honestly uh mike davis beat uh, Slava Borshev. This was another one, man, where we talked about this a little bit in the breakdown too. The ability to change levels in MMA is just so important. And while Slava Borshev may have been like, if you just had them in a kickboxing match over the course of three rounds, Slava probably would have won, right? Or did exceptional. Like he would have done much better than he did in an MMA fight. But when you start adding in that element of takedowns and stuff, right? And we talked about Mike Davis, good at getting guys to the ground, might not be blitzing through your guard once he gets there, but he has really good timing on his shots. And that's a difference maker going against a guy in Slava who doesn't have that offensive option in his arsenal. If you need to have you need to have takedown defense and stuff like that, like you saw, saw Jose Aldo had great takedown defense. Like if you have exceptional takedown defense, you can maybe get away with not being offensive with your grappling. But if you don't, then you need to add that element to your game, right? Like you need to try to add, you need to have a difference maker. And Mike Davis has that difference maker. Right, and it came through in this fight. Slava wanted the he had the option to keep it on his feet, and that was pretty much it. And Mike Davis had the option to take it to a different place other than the feet. Right? Sometimes that's all you need, man, and it got Mike Davis the win in this one. Sadiq Yusuf came out and blew through Don Shainus. Shainus, I don't know. I think it's Shainus. His nickname's Shameless, so I'm guessing like I actually didn't see this fight live. I actually missed. No, I had to rewatch this whole card. I didn't see any of these fights live. I saw the prelims live. 
But I had to go back and rewatch these the next day. But, man, again, you kind of knew Sadiq was going to do this to Don Shainess. This kid's making his UFC debut. Sadiq Yusuf has fought some of the, like, best featherweights in the world at this point. And he just hopped on a first-round guillotine, right? Like, that standing guillotine jumped up, latched on it, and... Man, it's a tough debut for Don Shanus. You just got one of the baddest motherfuckers in the 145-pound division. And one of the guys, I think, with a lot of promise. Does everything well. He's pretty defensively responsible. He has power, good technique in the stand-up, and he's really good on the ground. Really good at his offensive jiu-jitsu. Is really, this is what I'm talking about. Like, Sadiq Yusuf has a lot of elements to his game. That's what makes him so dangerous. He's very well-rounded right? And Don Shanus coming in is a guy who kind of needed to get the fight to the ground in order to win. And Sadiq doesn't need that. Plus, though, all that aside, Sadiq is just better. You can just tell when you're watching them that Sadiq is more technical. He's more tight with his combos and his jujitsu is just like more precise. And he's str- he, you could tell he was going to be stronger in all those positions. And like, he showed it, man. Got the guy out of there in 30 seconds to make quick, quick work of him. Uh, Howney Barcelos versus Trevin Jones. This was another one where, like, I said I liked all the favorites on this card, right, pretty much. But, I mean, Yen Nan was an exception to that, and obviously Daniel Santos against John Castaneda. But Howney Barcelos went out and, you know, did his thing. Just, he fucking, like, Howney is so good, and he's, like, the perfect example of the depth of the Bantamweight division, right? He just lost to Victor Henry and stuff like that, I know, but, like, 135 is so fucking deep, and Howney Barcelos is really good everywhere, right? I love how he throws combinations. I love his control when he's on the ground, when he gets on top. I love how he hunts for finishes. He can get to your back. He can do pretty much everything. Good leg kicks, good kicks to the body, good boxing combos. I mean, he really can mix it all together, and we got to see this in that fight against Trevin Jones. It's like the guy who has more options and can take the fight to a place where he's going to have an advantage is usually the one who's more successful. And the higher up you go, the more options you have, generally, the more successful you're going to be. It's why John Jones is so great. Demetrius Johnson is so great. Even Silva, you know, he got dominated by Sonnen off of his back, but still managed to come up with a finish in the last round. It's like, you have to have threats in every category of mixed martial arts in order to compete at the highest level, right? And I think Howney Barcelos is a guy who could potentially do that, and he got to, we got to see that, right? 17-3, and three, losses are to some tough guys. I think Howney Barcelos could still make a run in the Bantamweight division. He's a bad motherfucker. But you start running into that top-tier talent in there, that, like, top 15, there's some bad motherfuckers up there, too. So it's like, damn, 135 is so deep, right? But it's like technically... If you could take all of Howney Barcelos' technical still skills and somehow shove them into another weight class, he would do exceptionally well. But 135 is just so goddamn stacked. Um, let's see. Randy Brown uh, picked up a win over Francisco Trinaldo, but not without controversy. In that first round, he grabbed the fence that prevented a takedown. John Anik was fired up, man. Told uh, the ref to pull out his testicles and take a point. Like, he was upset about it. And, like... Rightfully so. Moments like that can impact the fight. And you guys know that when Francisco Trinaldo, as old as he might be, if he manages to get the fucking fight to the ground, he's going to be able to hold you there and do some damage. And we got to see that a little bit in the fight against Randy Brown. Who knows how much differently that goes or how the judges score the round based off of that takedown. Like, these things are difference makers. And this fight, if a point had been deducted, could have ended in a draw. Or if it wasn't, or if like the take that, if the fence grab had never happened and Trinaldo completed that takedown, he could have taken the first round. And then he comes out on top in this fight, right? So like, I don't know. I also felt like Brown was a little bit hesitant to use all of his weapons against Trinaldo. And understandably so. If you overextend on that guy and he gets into the pocket at all, he can bust you up. He's got good wrestling. So not that he doesn't have good reason to or didn't have good reason to, but. I just felt like he could have opened up a little bit more and held the range, and he would have had success. Like, a little more volume would have done him well in this fight, but still fought a good fight and got the win. Um, Fence grab, pretty egregious, though, and yeah, like I said, John Anik fired up about it, and rightfully so. You gotta, you have to start considering things like that. They, they change, it's cheating, and it changes the trajectory of a fight. All right, guys, so we get to the main event. And how about Yan Shaunan picking up a, an upset win over Mackenzie Dern? And this is like, again, we, the thing with Mackenzie Dern, man, is that, and she had talked about this afterwards, is like, 
she has to be able to finish some of these top contenders if she's going to start like it's very hard to just do jujitsu someone on in an mma fight for five rounds straight so when you get into these championship fights and you get into these main card spots against people like Marina Rodriguez, right? They don't need to be Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu world champions to beat you. And granted, we were talking earlier about how like you need to have multiple threats, right? Mackenzie Dern is obviously a specialist in grappling, right? And particularly Jiu-Jitsu. And her striking has come a lot long way. And I think she's done things to try to seal up those gaps. But when she gets the fight into advantageous positions, she has to be able to come up with a finish in a way similar to, like, Charles Oliveira is a master at that. Like, if Charles gets on your back, ooh, you might get choked the fuck out. You know what I mean? Damian Maya felt that way. If he gets to your back, like, you're going to get choked out. You know, the, there are people who have this exceptional ability to submit their opponents if they get to that advantageous position in MMA. And it's different from jiu-jitsu and especially someone like Dern who had a lot of success in the gi and stuff and is used to like getting grips, walking them up further and relying on maybe some of her grips to get chokes. Either way, I know a big difference maker, at least I've heard, I don't know from first-hand experience, but is the gloves. The gloves make a massive difference when you're trying to hand fight and go for chokes and stuff and you have to take that into consideration when you're training. And while Mackenzie Dern, her jiu-jitsu is undeniably amazing. Like, you can watch her do jiu-jitsu on these girls and realize that she's the superior grappler and has a much more firm understanding. She's not able to get them out of there at a high level. Like, when she runs into these really high-level girls, these top 10-type girls, she has a problem getting them out. And another example of somebody who probably isn't as skilled in terms of pure jiu-jitsu, Kamar Usman versus Leon Edwards. When Edwards took Usman down and moved to his back, you guys saw that Usman just remained, like, defensively responsible. Things are a lot more, in, from a BJJ perspective... Things are typically a lot more fundamental in order to stay safe, right? So, like, a lot of these advanced, like, arm trapping and stuff, I think, is very legit. Like, when you're on someone's back, there's a lot of offensive things you can do that do work that are, like, but for the most part, and, like, there are some new influences and stuff that carry, I'm not saying all that. All I'm saying is that defensively, you can stay fundamentally sound and keep yourself safe in an MMA fight. And coming up with finishes has been a challenge for Dern. And I don't know what the adjustment is she needs to make. Like I said, I don't know if it's the gloves interrupting things. I don't know if it's the lack of like, I don't know. I, I genuinely don't know. But she has to make some sort of adjustments and maybe look at the way that like Oliveira is controlling things and how he's getting to his finishes versus the mistakes that she's making that are letting her like I think one of the things that she does is she tries to go for she tries to advance like through a bunch of positions quickly and like hit with like a bunch of different submissions whereas like I feel like a more a more successful avenue to success is when you're on the back you're just hunting for the rear naked choke over and over and over again until you eventually get it and slide your hand through like working that one position constantly and hand fighting like relentlessly the whole time right like i feel like that's what you see Oliveira do and it's not that he i don't know i could be fucking i'm just rambling now but i just feel like she's got to do something to change her success rate with actually getting the finish because she works and i don't know if you guys notice this but like another thing dern does really well is when she gets attachment to you she's hard to shake off like, when she grabs you, you can tell that she's strong and she's got, like, a freakishly strong grip and girls have a hard time getting separation from her. She'll overhook your arm and clamp her elbow in real tight and stuff like that, and they have a really hard time, even in the clinch and stuff, getting away from the grips. I think Mackenzie Dern could still do very well at a high level, but Yan Shannon just showed that she could stay defensively responsible and lay down some, like, show, show Dern that she can grapple a little bit too, but really just, like, her striking. Her striking, she's got fast hands, and she just, you know, beat Dern in a decision. And I don't know. I think that if Dern could find a way to get finishes, she'd have a little more success. But I don't know what that answer is particularly. You know what I mean? Is it trying to control one particular position instead of, like, going for a submission that fails and you move to another position and try it again? Do you just try for one high percentage submission like the rear naked choke over and over and over again as opposed to stringing submission attempts together? I think that's kind of the answer, even though it might not be the same for sport jiu-jitsu. So, shit. Who knows? I don't know. Anyway, uh, let's see. Let's see. We have a fight coming up in a couple weeks. Nothing this weekend. Uh, the one championship card over the weekend was pretty cool. Stamp Fairtex was in that. Uh, I think it was Angela Lee uh, lost the title 
to uh, I'm pulling it up here. I forget the name. But Mikey, the thing I was really interested in, uh, I'm sorry, I don't want to skip over. Zhang versus Li. <clears throat> Zhang Jingnan, I'm sure I'm pronouncing that wrong. Uh, beat Angela Lee uh, to retain her title, I believe, or did she take the title? It was for the strawway title. I can't, I don't follow one close enough. Like, there's a, I know there's a history on all of this. Like, they fought twice before, and this was like the tiebreaker, and they each challenged each other for the title, but I can't remember who moved up and down. Uh, anyway, Stamp Fairtex looked good, and Mikey Musumeci is grappling over there, and I think he's one of the best pound for pound grapplers on the planet. If you just watch his technique, it's immaculate. He's. An expert at taking the back, a real leg lock specialist, and just like really good everywhere. But man, he's he's fun to watch. And um, him being over there in one, and Gordon Ryan having a contract there as well, makes jujitsu exciting, and it puts it on an accessible platform. Like Amazon Prime now, I just turn it on. And I have Thursday Night Football and fucking jujitsu with one, cha- and then fights with one championship, and then they mix in their Muay Thai fights. And like, I really like what one's doing, and it kind of gives you this like access to MMA and everything, in a way that is. Uh, it kind of sprinkles in these other sports and it kind of piques your interest in them because they're just like thrown in and surrounded by MMA. And it's a good way to kind of like, like I said, introduce some of these sports that are, you know, maybe folks aren't paying as much attention to, but you kind of throw it in there in a, between an MMA fight and people are like, oh, what the fuck's this about? And you got people like Rod Tang over there banging it out like, damn, one's doing some stuff right. I'm a fan. All right. Uh, I wanted to talk about one more thing, and this was a headline that I saw, and this is Jake Paul transitioning to MMA, and he said he had something set up where he is going to go fight for, you know, a big organization, and he's talked to Javier Mendez, and, uh, you know, uh, he said that he could come to AKA and train with him and Habib. Man, what I think is going to happen... He's got to go box Anderson Silva first, right? And by the way, just to like sidetrack from this MMA transit, like if he can make this MMA transition or not, like just a second here. Jake Paul boxing Anderson Silva scares me because Anderson Silva, regardless of what you want to say about his match against like Julio Cesar Chavez, all this stuff, he's old, man. And Jake is young and Jake has only been putting attention into boxing. And everybody keeps saying, Oh, he's got a real fight in front of him now. Like, Anderson Silva can box. Yes, he can. But Jake is big, and pressure, and all that stuff matters. Do I think that Silva gives him a harder time than, like, Tyron Woodley? For sure. For sure. I think Silva, his head movement and everything, I think that he's going to have trouble. He's going to be much more elusive than Woodley would have been. He's going to be much more selective with the strikes, much more clean, much more crisp. He's going to know when to take chances, when not to. I don't think it's easy for Jake Paul to put Anderson Silva away. But goddamn, when people start getting old and you get somebody like Jake Paul who has legitimate knockout power and he's young and he's big and he can just march you down in a boxing match where you can only use your hands, man, I it is going to be a sad, sad thing if Jake Paul does manage to somehow knock out the greatest, one of the greatest mixed martial artists of all time. And I don't necessarily, I'm not a fan of this fight. And not that... I don't want to knock Tyron Woodley or Ben Askren for accepting either of those. Like, I think they were great mixed martial artists as well. But Anderson Silva is like Mount Rushmore type shit. And if you get, if, if somehow, if something happens, if Jake Paul knocks out a legend in Anderson Silva, it's going to be very disappointing to the MMA community. And uh, it's going to hurt my heart. It will. Like, I don't like the matchup. I don't like the fight. I hope Silva goes in, does well. If I'm being completely honest with you guys, like if Silva knocks him out and stuff and whatever and exposes Jake, whatever. But like I think Jake is pretty good. I think he's been committing to this hard. And man, I honest to God, this is all like I I just want Silva to get out of the fight safely. That's how I feel. Like I'm interested to see how Jake does. I'm interested to see how good Silva really is. But Jake is young. I'm trying to be realistic with myself. I just want Silva to make it out of the fight without getting highlight reeled or some shit. That's my opinion. Anyway, let's move on to whether he can make the MMA transition. There's a very good argument. If you look at Habib, you look at Frankie Edgar, the two most important elements of fighting are boxing and wrestling. There are specialists like Israel Adesanya that like kind of show us an exception to that rule, right? Where he really is a specialist in the striking department. He has to rely on some takedown defense and stuff like that. But in general... 
I think, and not that Frankie Edgar is like one of the greatest of all time. Like he was a, I mean, don't, Frankie Edgar was a bad motherfucker back in the day. Lightweight champion, right? And now he's fighting all the way down to 135. And 20 pounds when you're that little is a big gap, right? So Frankie Edgar was a bad motherfucker. But he, his style just came to mind when I thought of the boxing wrestling. But Habib in particular, right? Habib's not throwing like these fancy looking fucking high kicks or question mark kicks or anything. He just wrestles you and boxes you. And Jake has a wrestling background from high school, right? And he also now has a boxing background. And when you know how to throw your hands around and you're a better like striker than your opponent and you feel competent on the feet and your ability to box, it opens up sometimes opportunities for these takedown attempts. So it's not like Jake has to be a world-class wrestling expert. If he just has a good shot from high school and can use his hands to start, he's going to now... When he says he wants to go to AKA and work, he's going to have to work on all this, right? Obviously. But if he can start using his hands to set up his takedown attempts and get on top of somebody in an MMA fight, that's the most important thing. Can you use your hands to get to a level change, get them to the ground, and get on top and stay on top? If he can do that, you might see this motherfucker have some success. And what I think is going to happen is he's going to go train at AKA after he fights Silva. Win or lose, it's a good fight for him. I don't think he's going to get the absolute shit kicked out of him in that fight. He'll probably re- leave relatively healthy, go train at AKA for a year, and then go fight for Eagle FC, Habib's promotion. And they'll probably give him a relatively, like, a, a decent opponent, a fair opponent. And I think he could do well. Because everybody always says there's a big difference in like Olympic style wrestling or freestyle wrestling and MMA wrestling. And that's 100% true. But if that's true, then you have to also assume that Jake Paul can be the sort of sponge that he was when he went into boxing and learn how to take just his shot and getting the fight to the ground and learning those elements of control and learning those differences between whatever he developed in high school up to that point. And what he needs now. I think that he could bridge the gap. And I like, I, I'm not kidding. I think that he could find some good success. I think that if he can use his boxing to set up the takedowns. And if they can teach him all this timing. And then how to control the fight on the ground. And then just some common like methodologies and stuff about him. And the things that he's going to need. And just like get him a game plan. I think he could do fucking well. A year spent somewhere. You can make a lot of progress. Right? I'm telling you, man, he, he could go over and do it. I really think that. And I don't want to be the guy who's just sitting here fucking hitting on Jake Paul because so far there's nothing to really say about what he's done but fucking congrats, you know? So I'm not going to hate. I'm just interested to see how this plays out. And I do think that if he went to a world-class gym that, you know, especially AKA where they – it's fun. I always find the irony in the fact that it's American Kickboxing Academy – and granted, like, Islam Makachev, good kickboxer, right? And, like, at least in terms of, like, MMA standards and Luke Rockhold. But, like, they're really known for the ground game, you know? They're really known for the wrestling and stuff. And it would be a good gym. Also, think about Daniel Cormier, boxing and wrestling. That's what, It would be a good matchup for Jake Paul and the base that he has. And it would be a good place for him to go and train and then make a transition into a promotion like Eagle FC. You know it's not going to be the UFC. He's got too much beef with Dana White. But you know Habib would sign Jake Paul to bring attention to his promotion too. It would all work out. I think that's what happens. I don't know. I think he could fucking do it. And I think you might see Jake Paul fight in MMA at the end of 2023 or early 2024. We'll see. I'm not doubting the kid. I think he could. All right, guys. Anyway. That's going to wrap this one up. I just kind of wanted to BS about some of the stuff that happened over the weekend. I started lifting again today. And like, I think, A, I think I tore my fucking rotator cuff. I can like, but I started lifting and I think I like, I can't tell if I fucked it up worse or made it better. I've been trying to like rehab it and get range of motion back like to a certain point. Right. But man, I don't know. I'm fucking sore. I haven't lifted literally since college. So like six or seven years. But anyway, besides the point, if you guys enjoyed, do me a favor, hit the subscribe button, give it a thumbs up, all that good shit we got to ask you to do. And I will see you guys next time. I'll try to get, maybe I'll get a podcast out this weekend to kind of like break up. Uh, nothing going on in the fight world, really, you know, like no fights coming up, but we'll definitely have a breakdown out for the Grosso versus Arujo card. So keep an eye out for that. And otherwise have a good day, guys. Thank you for tuning in. Bye-bye.